Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, it's it's my pleasure to uh, have all of you here uh, for the end of semester and of fall 22 project showcase. Um, and as you all know, this program is a collaboration between NYU and Ukrainian Catholic University. Uh, and most of the topics that we cover are responsible AI topics. Uh, so we will start and uh, go through an overview of all of the various uh, projects, but before then, just to once again introduce ourselves, I'm Julia Stojanovic. Uh, it's it's my pleasure to be helping run this program together with Yaroslav. Yaroslav, please say a couple of words. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, Julia, thank you very much for, for doing all this. Uh, just very, very short uh, mention. Today, uh, there was kind of another shelling of Ukraine. There were uh, 76 missiles uh, sent by Russia uh, to Ukraine. 60 missiles uh, were uh, caught by our uh, army forces. We improved this percentage every time. So we started from 50%, now it's 80%. And indeed, we have no electricity for about four or five year, uh, hours in the morning. And we still think here that it is a normal day. Uh, mm -hmm. We still uh, want to, to do something. And I would like to thank uh, uh, New York University, Yulia, you and all involved uh, in this project for making us feel that we, are, we have normal life. We can do research, we can study, we can teach, and we can talk uh, uh, to you. Thank you very much and good luck to all uh, who presents today. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Yaroslav, and thank you to, to all the students. Uh, most of all, you really all are just amazing role models, I think, for us, because you know you, you all are making great progress and are keeping a positive outlook despite this horrendous and unreal uh, war that, that is going on. So we really are fortunate to, to be working with you. So let's let's keep it up, and this is, this is what we can do, right? To resist is to just make sure that that our lives are less impacted than the enemy would like. Uh, and uh, Tanya, please say a couple of words. Tanya coordinated this this entire uh, presentation, so uh, thank you, Tanya. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, Julia. Thank you, Yaroslav. Anyway, I, I guess it's a definitely the victory for all of us that uh, now we have the final presentations after like we we have started at September and we have all the, all the teams here now and they can share their results and this is a huge work and uh, I, I'm pretty sure that it uh, it was really serious research and uh, that uh, all teams will continue and finish with very very nice uh, publications I guess um, so looking forward for it <laughs> All right, great. Uh, so this is just to uh, thank all the all the faculty mentors, uh, Bill Howe, Damon McCoy, Leonid Lipkin, uh, and I also have been mentoring uh, teams. And uh, these are our amazing graduate student mentors who have been working very, very closely with, uh, with the project teams. Andrew Bell, Bernice Herman, Paula Arif Khan, Ian Solano Kamaiko, Laura Edelson, Lucas Rosenblatt, and Tobias Lauinger. Thank you all. And let's start with the first presentation. Uh, let's try to keep this to five minutes uh, of, of presentation. And then we will ask, as usual, right? We will spend maybe a minute or two on Q&A, and at the end, we can have a discussion. OK. OK, so uh, I can start. Uh, so hello, everyone. My name is Denis. And, uh, my mentors are Fala and Julia, and we are working on incorporating stability objectives into the design of data intensive pipelines. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so uh, actually, during the first two check ins, I worked on the research stability of incremental ML models. And after that, Fala proposed just to uh, like summarize some work which we uh, have done during the summer and during the first two check ins and uh, uh, create uh, like some intermediate paper before uh, um, like publishing this with uh, incremental ML models. So, current research, uh, like we are targeting to introduce a new family of variance based fairness measures. And also, we want to continue. Uncertainty at different stages of the 
whole model life cycle and next slide and um, yeah this um, like basic model life cycle looks like this one so we have uh, data collection stage data engineering pre-processing uh, model training model selection and so on so we're going to conduct uh, some experiments in the uh, in each of these uh, stages so here you can see uh, six labels from one to six uh, for each stage and each of, in each of them we want to uh, like research stability for them and um, uh, next slide please uh, so uh, during the last uh, month, I mainly uh, concentrated on the first experiment. So, so here is overview. So we have uh, like basic uh, workflow here. So we load our data set, make pre-processing. Next, we fine tune our models for data sets. And after that, we make our analysis. So here we uh, make two types of analysis. First type is for quantifying uncertainty for subgroups with bootstrapping. And next type is compute bias metrics. And after that, we visualize our results, which we are, which I'm going also to present on this presentation. Next slide. And uh, yeah, if you go deeper to some uh, uh, stages like hyperparameter tuning and metric measuring, so they can be visualized with this next diagram. So on the left hand side in hyperparameter um, tuning stage, uh, we have basic uh, workflow where we have initial train set. After that, we make uh, uh, we, we make hyperparameter tuning based on K-fold cross-validation. And after that, we get uh, best model hyperparameters, uh, which we will use for uh, matrix measuring stage. Uh, of course, we also evaluate uh, our uh, models on test set. And uh, as a result uh, of the left hand inside stage we have uh, performance metrics for each model and uh, on the right, right hand side um, on the matrix measuring stage so we are using bootstrapping to compute uh, uncertainty quantification metrics so it's uh, just a basic approach uh, and uh, here we have the same initial train set uh, so from previous stage we just use uh, uh, our best uh, hyper parameters so here we need to uh, train our models so we train them in uh, a bootstrapping fashion so for that we create a uh, random we get a uh, random 80 uh, percent of train sets and uh, for each of them we train our models and uh, using test set we get uh, models predictions so each model will uh, have its predictions and using these predictions we can uh, uh, compute overall variance metrics also we can compute variance metrics for subgroups and uh, also bias metrics for subgroups next slide and uh, yeah, so uh, as a result, we get uh, such a confusion matrix uh, of variance and bias metrics for each model. So on the upper side, you can see variance metrics like uh, standard deviation, interquartile rate, cheating, label stability. We compute them uh, like uh, for overall and uh, for subgroups. Uh, for example, here we have uh, two protected groups like sex and race. And uh, so we combine them for them separately and also for their intersection and also we we um, compute um, our bias matrix for, uh, for them. And I mean, bias matrix like uh, true positive rate, uh, accuracy, uh, selection rate, and so on. Uh, next slide. And yeah, just to summarize what, what I've done during the last month. So I created just such a framework where we we have whole pipeline in generic analyzers based on class inheritance. I try to make it uh, as smart as possible uh, to easy to reuse in the future since uh, our data set, which we use, we use fault tables. So it's quite cool benchmarking data set. So uh, really a lot of uh, future papers can be conducted on the, the data set. So um, framework is uh, almost finished. Next one is, uh, uh, I fine tuned uh, seven models. Also, I uh, made two runs for first type experiment, and results I will show on the next slide. And also, I visualized different metrics. And on the next slide, uh, uh, we can see uh, our uh, uh, visualizations. So, here's just visualizations for different uh, uh, models uh, for bias metrics. And next slide. Uh, so, from um, yeah, from that, we can conclude this just for uh, no, no, back. Uh, oh, sorry. So was, yeah, highlights. Yeah. So here we have, uh, uh, yes, we can conclude that uh, just uh, such models like decision tree classifier, random forest and XGPUS classifier are co uh, quite uh, the best in terms of bias metrics for our task. And next slide. Uh, um, here is analysis of variance uh, metrics on the left hand side. Um, we have um, uh, per sample accuracy and the label stability on the right hand side, standard deviation, interquartile range, and jitter. And next slide. Uh, um, 
Yeah, from that we can conclude that uh, logistic regression, uh, uh, logistic regression and the forms of energy boosts uh, are quite well in terms of stability uh, for mainly or almost all variance metrics here. And uh, next slide. Um, uh, yeah, also we made next visualizations when we took uh, one variance metric, uh, also we took one bias metric, and uh, uh, for each of them, for example, we take a pair, pair like uh, sex race privilege and sex race uh, disadvantage, and we take difference for variance metric and for bias metric, so we have just two points here, and uh, on the next slide, uh, we try them to visualize in such a way uh, where we, so if, if it is more close to uh, zero value, so this means that our model is quite well, like in fairness and also in stability. And uh, just to analyze uh, all of that, uh, uh, like plots, I I find out that uh, models are more biased in terms of uh, sex than in terms of race. And for example, on this slide, uh, it is highlighted on the second plot. On the next slide, um, yeah, also the same thing. And on the last slide. Uh, we have the same uh, thing. So actually, pipeline is ready, and so I'm I'm ready to conduct uh, all experiments here and to make more analysis. So uh, actually, um, that's it. Uh, so do you have any questions? I can answer them. Thank you, Denise. Yeah. And so our plan is to work towards a fact submission, right? Which is yeah, due yeah. in February. Yeah. Yes. As, as many of us know. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, I have one actually. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you have any, so you mentioned like uh, some different model classes are performing uh, like better or worse. Like one example you gave was like decision trees working, uh, performing better with respect to bias. Do you have any theories on like why certain types of models might be working better or worse? Uh, serious, I, I just uh, like from uh, empirical studies, uh, I noticed that, but uh, here, here we have uh, quite um, uh, a lot of features and in general, just uh, tree-based models work quite well when we have uh, a lot of uh, meaningful features. Maybe this is the main thing here. Um, and I, I tried uh, different uh, um, states from this uh, full tables and yeah, so um, conclusions pretty much the same though, that tree-based models are quite uh, maybe the best in terms of accuracy and uh, uh, FN score and also have quite, quite good uh, stability ability here so um yeah maybe such such answer um yeah interesting yeah it might be nice to look at like the like features that are being used by some of the tree-based models as opposed to other models and see if there's like differences too and how they're weighting them like maybe the importances or the orders are different but yeah it makes yeah. sense nice. yeah really nice yeah, work cool. yeah cool thanks anyone else Okay. So let's let's continue to the next presentation, and then we can also have a discussion at the end. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, you can. Is the, do you hear? Okay, yeah, thank yes. you. Uh, so uh, this and this month uh, for this month uh, really haven't done a lot of work, but we we have done uh, some, and we have gained some different results. Okay, so uh, first is uh, the last time. Sorry, the next slide. I need next slide. Yeah, thank you. So last time we talked about the dynamic function that would help us generate tangible bit queries. This means that we would not uh, get recursively stuck into uh, calling and calling other um, graph functions, uh, which would generate the query uh, for which would make query longer and not longer, and so basically get us because the graph is potentially infinite because of the functional structure, uh, it uh, uh, resulted uh, in uh, that we generated queries of uh, infinite size, basically. And uh, the program failed to generate lots of them. And this is why we uh, started, uh, we prioritized in generating the dumping function at this time. And so this function uh, allowed us to, to finally generate uh, tentatively big queries and get the first results and run the testing. Now, next slide. Uh, how we built this function. Can you, next slide. Hey, okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, the function was built in a way, uh, so uh, uh, using this form. So we have the initial probability, which is currently assigned here for me. So for example, uh, we have uh, here on the right hand side, the subgraph. Uh, 
uh, in the uh, for the, the subgraph from our uh, from our graph, and uh, we, you can see uh, some nodes there. And uh, this, for example, string which is pink, uh, the string nodes, it has three atoms, and and they both they all have the probability of one third. And so this probability is the p uh, in this formula. And so we divide this p by the square root of the uh, current number of states uh, in the power of d. And the and d is the distance in terms of how many in terms of the minimal number of uh, call nodes until the exit node of the function. So, for example, uh, the string node itself, the uh, calling node of the, of the function, the first node of the function, uh, the starting node, it has the value zero because, uh, like, if we go to the random string literal, we just uh, can go right away to the exit without calling any uh, subgraph, uh, any any functional subgraphs. Uh, but if we go to the stream, the minimal number is one because the, there is only a way. Uh, there is we, we cannot we cannot uh, go to the exit without uh, calling the function at least once. So uh, this is the value of S n here. Uh, sorry, this is the value of d here. And so uh, if the value of d is zero, we just divide by one, so the probability can change. Uh, if the d is bigger than zero, then uh, we uh, divide by square root of Sn of or Sn or three thirds, three seconds of Sn, and so on. Uh, then we normalize probabilities after that, so they sum up to one. Uh, this is uh, how this function works, uh, we, and this is the function which allowed us to generate tangible integers. Next slide. Thank you. So, uh, and we uh, obviously we uh, right away we run uh, the equivalence testing on those queries we generated. And turned out that 99.42% of the queries were equivalent. But uh, this results, although they look really promising, it's uh, really too early to say that these are the final results and, the, and we are done. Because uh, first of all, there is, uh, although we are sure it's correct, uh, there is no really a way currently to test the correctness of the function that tests the equivalence of queries under two values and three values logic. Because if we uh, make some made some bugs in there, they would affect the results, but we wouldn't know they exist because there is no second way to check that. Uh, this is why we would like to create some uh, tests which would independently check whether the, uh, the whether the equivalence testing works, uh, maybe by uh, trial and error or by experience. Uh, and the next thing is that we would uh, generate queries not artificially, but we would uh, create a uh, new trainable dynamic function, which we would train on real uh, human written queries to uh, make them more realistic and more uh, like to alike to being written by humans and by real programmers. Uh, and so from that, next slide, uh, is our aims for the future work. And I kept it simple in this, in this list. So, so first we design a trainable dynamic function. Currently it is not trainable, it's just a static dynamic function. Uh, it's, uh, I believe the text here is not full, but uh, the, th the thing is that we want to generate a trainable training function and a metric uh, that would allow us to uh, evaluate whether the queries are realistic or not. Uh, this uh, means that probably uh, we would need to train some kind of a discriminator network for that. Uh, and there are actually many approaches to that. So, yeah. Uh, the next, we would need to find uh, big scale query datasets if such exists, or generate our own uh, from the GitHub uh, training purpose, from the GitHub uh, for training those uh, dynamic functions, which would be uh, which uh, trainable dynamic functions. And uh, then we would, in the end, uh, need to design, uh, design, design tests to ensure that activity function uh, is what I have talked about already. So these are the three directions. And I believe that when we finish, when we finish with that, uh, we would be able to get uh, really the uh, first reliable results from this work uh, and be able to write a bit. So thank you. Thank you very much. Alexander, would you like to add anything or do you need? Uh, well, the one thing to add is, you know, the, 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 
th this will be written up as a proper submission, but in the next year or so, it's mm -hmm. nothing has been done yet. And uh, in that regard, it's my fault because uh, I had this sort of perfect end of the year storm and I dropped the ball a little bit. Uh, but I will catch up and I'm actually pleased to see that this, this, this guys are amazing. They continue working even I, you know, even, even on my disappearance under the circumstances. But yeah, so we'll, we'll catch up with them very soon. And um, I think I, I think there is a proper good quality conference submission in uh, in this work once it's finished. So. Alexander, anything from you? Uh, hello, uh, actually, I have nothing to add. Uh, Mikhailo explained the full idea pretty, pretty, pretty much well. Uh, so thank you. Great. Um, and uh, for for repositories of queries, there is such a thing as SQL share, uh, which is a couple of years old now. And actually, Bill Howe, who doesn't seem to be on the call today, was one of the people who I think is was responsible for that project. So you may want to reach out to Bill Howe and also take a look at SQL share. Oh. I think that the idea behind it was to serve as a kind of a GitHub for SQL queries. But there may be also more recent repositories. He, he may know. Uh, yes, yeah, I know like people in the RDF world, they are much better at organizing their queries and letting others access it. And it's uh, surprising that uh, database folks, the mainstream database folks are not there. So, But I didn't know about this project, actually. So. Yeah, yes, yeah, SQL yeah. share out of Excellent. the University of Washington. Excellent. Thanks. Questions? Thank anybody? Comments? Okay, so we're moving to the next project then, yes? Tanya and Nazar, please. <laughs> so hello again. Uh, our team working on uh, optimizing multiple fairness metrics in resource constrained public policy tasks with Andrew Bell. So the next slide. Uh, and the next one, we just uh, would like to remind uh, uh, so, so our the tasks, so we are, uh, studying the feasibility of optimizing multiple fairness metrics and uh, just assume that we have uh, a data set D and some error rate resource constraint and some fairness window and we just wondering does there exist a set of k observations for which fairness constraints for FPR, FNR, PPV actually from impossibility theorem are satisfied and those fairness constraints do not increase the error rate. Uh, of course, if uh, such set exists, uh, there should be uh, some models that uh, could select this, uh, those observations. So, uh, and uh, this model would uh, satisfy this multiple fairness uh, constraints. So the next slide. Uh, from the previous checkups, we uh, told that we borrowed ideas from fair ranking and create mixed integer linear programming that could perform this uh, analysis as that we described. And we uh, even uh, develop uh, some solution. So the next slide. Uh, oh, oh, here. <laughs> okay, I will tell you that uh, here we have uh, quite a big challenge with uh, PPV because uh, it cannot be linearized. And for that solution that uh, Nazar will, will tell, uh, we approximated uh, somehow it with other metrics like TP, TPR, and AS. But also we have some ideas how to work with it. And I will tell about this later. So the next slide. So uh, what we do, we uh, have this our fairness evaluator, which we tell like previous and maybe previous previous uh, uh, time about them. But we also uh, have some updates from this month. We uh, fixed some uh, bugs which we have and uh, added uh, like uh, uh, when we can use not always precisions, but we can also uh, use an accuracy, but it isn't in our like uh, main uh, uh, part because uh, accuracy can be uh, not very good when we do not have like a balance data set. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, we tested uh, our uh, uh, like uh, fairness evaluator in more than uh, 20 data sets, uh, which you can see in the slides. It was something like the ZNO, which have like uh, uh, more than uh, 
uh, 10 different uh, uh, sub data sets which we also used and uh, uh, for this we created like difference of the att attributes our uh, like gender and ethnicity and uh, their intersections uh, next slide please and uh, uh, what we have like as outputs, we have like the uh, graph uh, with uh, uh, our uh, matrices, like precision and recall with constraint and unconstrained, with, we can see that it's the same. When we try to, uh, and in the bottom, we can see like the, uh, like uh, the windows and uh, the uh, plots of the matrices, which we try to optimize. And for the sum uh, way before the recall is equal to one, we have like all in our uh, constraint. But after that, we can see that precision uh, grows up and it happened because we cannot uh, like uh, have this, our precisions in, in the bounds. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So uh, after we created uh, a lot of our uh, experiments, we have some ideas uh, why it's, the results can be good. And uh, uh, some of them, it's uh, overall prevalence, the prevalence difference, number of groups and ads, uh, which can be uh, like uh, a main idea to do our next steps. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, I want to remember uh, why we do this, is that we have this uh, uh, Joel shows uh, uh, theorem that's told us that it's impossible to have the uh, value equal to one, but we know that in the practice, we do not need this, our matrix equal, uh, so we can have some windows. And uh, like in other words, we can uh, re uh, relax the value on our matrix in the follow in some following way. And next slide, please. And by the way, this this theorem is by Alexandra Kuldakova, who's Ukrainian originally. Oh my God! Oh, really? oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> it is a statistician. She's on the faculty at uh, Carnegie Mellon, CMU. I think she was born in the US, but she's uh, of Ukrainian descent. That's really interesting. We should check yeah. the, uh, her biography. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, but anyway, I, I will continue. So the idea is uh, just imagine that we have like two different groups and uh, we would like uh, to have some, um, some fairness and uh, we uh, can put not equal this um, like this matrix should not be uh, like uh, def like equal precisely, but they sh could be uh, have some difference uh, that we denoted like epsilon values, and uh, we could rewrite uh, these two equations for both of these groups, like uh, one uh, equation in relaxation terms, and you can see uh, on the bottom of this page, and the next uh, slide, <laughs> and then we can do some algebra manipulation and try to solve it uh, for better or V, it doesn't matter, but anyway, uh, when we use this equation for better and uh, try to fix uh, some values values for P and epsilon P and uh, do some, some uh, variation in absolute terms, we can create uh, something like uh, this plot uh, where we can uh, try to find uh, this fairness area. Uh, we click the next. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but actually we have here quite a uh, uh, quite problem we have. It, it is quite hard to find an exact expression for, for this area of this shape. Uh, actually, we we, we uh, are working on this, and and maybe we will find some something interesting. But anyway, uh, for now we try to calculate uh, the estimate of this area by discretizing uh, this space. And we could click next. Um, so the the idea just uh, to to put. Um, uh, dot whenever uh, our lines cr cross uh, that that line and uh, to calculate the some somehow of approximation of this fairness area. So the next and uh, uh, one more like future work that we are cu currently actually working that uh, somehow uh, work on linearization of PPV 
uh, so the, the next we have uh, some idea uh, to use some uh, su smart substitution to uh, transfer our problem to mixed integer quadratically constrained quadratic programming uh, problem uh, with use of Charles Cooper's transformation for fraction LPs and uh, actually uh, NMDT technique, so normalized multi-parametric disaggregation technique. We are all just on uh, on the way, and I, I really hope that we will manage to uh, to go in that direction and have some uh, other uh, way how we can uh, solve our problem with uh, uh, this PVV <laughs> that is not linearizable. So I guess that, that, that's all. Uh, I would like to thank all my team, Andrew and Nazar, because they are uh, like the best team ever. <laughs> Thank you very much. Some questions. Yeah. Yes, Andrew, uh, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I'll just say um, that we're also preparing this uh, for submission for fact um, on February 6th. So we'll have a submission there. And this project has been like, uh, there's been, it's like a, one of those research projects that has been like a lot of three steps forward, two steps back, like not always understanding which direction to go, where to go, but it's finally coming together at the end, which I think is like really rewarding. So super excited to finish this and get the paper in. And also, we have two other people from the group, right? Who have <laughs> true, yeah, exactly. Working uh, so, on this. Yeah, please. Yeah, also Lucas uh, Rosenblatt and Lucius uh, Brynum have also been working with us too, um, and so uh, they're they've been helping a lot on the theoretical side, like with some of those theoretical results that that Tanya and Nazar presented with the fairness area. Great hmm. questions. Anybody? I have one. Uh, is there any intuition? Have you been able to build any intuition to what data sets potentially would will would fit within this kind of like window of of like um, fairness constraint? You want to take this, Tanya Nazar, or I can if you don't want to. For me now, now it's hard to tell. Maybe you can. <laughs> yeah, so I think the biggest thing that we've noticed and um, is like what it has to do with the difference in the base rates or the difference in the prevalence. Um, and so empirically, there's definitely some there's some noise, but I mean, we've found some uh, our, our results seem to indicate actually some pretty like concrete things that we can extract where it seems to be like a close base rate is anything between like zero and 10% difference. Um, most of our data sets and Tanya and Nazar have run like tons and tons of empirical experiments. So um, if, if back me up, if, if I'm saying anything weird or anything, but I'm pretty sure it's like, generally speaking, if we're in the zero to 10% range, uh, we can generally find solutions that optimize all three metrics. And then as we start to get up towards like 15%, it gets a little bit dicier. It's like some data sets, yes, some data sets, no. And we need to understand like the intuition there a bit better. Uh, and then like 20% and over is a pretty, we it's like, it seems to be pretty difficult to, to do this. <laughs> and we actually have some theoretical results that support that. You agree with that, Tanya and Nazar? Does that sound about right from what we observed? Yeah, yeah, it is absolutely yeah. right. And, and I, I guess I, if we will finish with that theoretical part, we will see uh, more uh, more precisely which condition should should be for the, the data sets. And it's an interplay, right, between uh, uh, prevalence rate difference and how accurate your classifier can yes. be so some things that are just True. harder to classify than others, right? So True, yeah. It, we, we ran all of our, that's a great point. We ran all of our empirical experiments um, for the most part, like when we when we ran like our, a mass amount of them, um, assuming that the classifier is making like 30% errors to, 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 to make sure that it's not like a perfect predictor. Um, and so that that's what I just said is based on kind of like that 70, you know, maximum 70% accuracy. Um, but as you change that, that also affects you know, the closer you are to a perfect predictor, then, you know, maybe the the, the further apart the base rates can be. Um, and we're still exploring exactly how that uh, is interplaying, but that's, yeah, that's a great point, Julia. That's the other thing that's happening there. Any other questions? Just want to see where we are quickly in the presentation. Maybe I need to reload something or, no, okay. So we have this one now. Oops, why am I okay? Good. So let's let's go to the, the next team. Arise, please. 
yes, hello. Uh, please, uh, next slide, maybe. Um, so we're building this tool for RISE. This is uh, a high school uh, program uh, for uh, students. And so uh, we're working on uh, making this uh, tool for uh, equitable um, admissions. Uh, and we had meeting with them uh, last uh, month. So uh, this is what uh, we were working uh, since. Uh, next slide. Uh, so first is school stable. It was uh, like also implemented previously, but we adjusted it. Uh, so we created, um, we had some problems with the data sets because uh, there were um, different identifiers uh, for uh, schools. That's why uh, we adjusted it. Uh, and uh, so uh, there were uh, at first many missing data, but uh, after um, our work, uh, there are uh, much more data that uh, Arise uh, uses from now on uh, to contact schools um, that uh, have less uh, applicants, for example, to uh so that uh, students from the schools uh, also apply for these programs and also um we added this uh, new column economic needs index uh, this shows uh, uh like uh, for example free lunch uh, so uh how many uh, students uh, in schools uh, uh, need some uh, economic help uh, next slide uh, and also we created uh, tables uh, for applicant accounts uh, for different neighborhoods uh, and also decisions for this uh, neighborhoods for these applicants. Uh, also, there is similar table for zip codes uh, and uh, we will just uh, need to choose which one we will use. Uh, next slide. Uh, also, this is um, a chart for applications uh, start date. Uh, so if we can uh, like zoom in uh, and uh, see uh, some different uh, uh, dates here. Uh, next slide. Uh, and also the same chart, but for submitted dates. So we see that most people submit uh, on the late uh, uh, deadline. <laughs> <laughs> next slide. Uh, yeah, so as mentioned in the previous presentation, we have received data set with a lot of important insights, uh, the main of which is stage data. Uh, so it has information on all the stages of the submission pipeline, so on which stage uh, the person was uh, declined submission, on which it was accepted. And the problem is we need to merge this uh, data with the data we had before, so with the normalized data. Uh, and to work with this uh, joint data and to have all these stages information to work with and to implement it to the dashboard, and so on. But we don't have any common key between these uh, two data sets. And uh, even if we do, uh, even if, if the columns are uh, uh, similar between the data sets, they sometimes have uh, different values and so on. Uh, so for now, uh, we're working on merging this data set. And can next slide, please? Yeah, and we have some uh, success. So we need to merge on the submit applications because not submitted applications, they don't have the stage data. So because the applications don't go to another stages on the pipeline. Uh, and uh, but we need to get uh, stage information for the submitted applications. Uh, so so far we managed to merge uh, 688 uh, submissions out of 768, and uh, 80 more are patiently waiting to be. Merged. So this is so on what we're working now. So next slide, please. Uh, yeah, and of course we're working on the paper. And next slide. Uh, yes, which will be submitted to CSV conference uh, in a month. And uh, we incorporate uh, the paper new stage data, new findings. Uh, maybe next slide. Uh, Lots of mentions of the word STEM here visually. We should maybe. Yeah, <laughs> <of> STEM, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should uh, make a statistics of mention of STEM word on the paper. Uh, <laughs> next, next, can you uh, change? Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, and we incorporate uh, findings, of course, this stage data, new stage data in the form of such nice graphics as this. Uh, and also, we will add dashboard tools, screenshots, of course. Uh, yeah, and uh, we are uh, 
uh, excited to tell that ARISE uh, widely use uh, our results and uh, there are three workers in ARISE uh, using the data and insights which provided uh, to them. Uh, and as I mentioned, they reach underrepresented schools in terms of race and family income, as well as geographic location to try to get more applications for them and even provide a better support. Uh, so, for example, uh, we'll help them with some suggestions uh, to ask questions about language spoken at home, uh, to better understand uh, Hispanic applications and why they aren't completing applications and to, on which stage ARISE can intervene and help them to submit these applications. Yeah, and connect to the last slide. Yeah, and to the next. Uh, yeah, uh, so that's it. And uh, for now, our goal is to finish this merging pro process to have all the data, incorporate this data to the dashboard and uh, small edits, and of course, to write paper and submit it and to be proud that we submitted. And uh, it, uh, if it will be accepted, we will be more proud. Yeah, and to the end, I, I would, and all of our team would be very happy to uh, like to thank Yan and thank Julia for this amazing project. We will so happy to work with you and uh, uh, we are a little bit depressed that the project is over and uh, it, it, it was a really cool journey thank you so much wonderful yeah, if you have any questions we could ask we thank could you ask all you. and then also alina right is, is not here but she yeah yes uh, unfortunately she's not here but uh, yeah she, her slides are presented and she are part of presentation too good and yeah, don't worry about uh, this project ending. There's lots more in, in the responsible AI area, right? That we can uh, we can work on together. Questions, please, or Ian, anything to add? Oh, Ian is sad. Yeah. Um, no, that's that was great. Yeah, I would just want to under underline like we've been in kind of like constant contact with Arise in the organization and been able to pass off a lot of this work that's being done to them and they have they've actually hired a, a it's like a team of like three interns over the summer over this kind of uh or sorry over this break to uh to help them based on the data reach out to schools reach out to contacts and and a lot of the insights that we provided actually impacted their this um, next application process so the kind of like questions they ask how they ask it etc so that's really cool because I think sometimes in research we don't always see those direct results at least that quickly um, so I want to highlight that and that's, that's the great really work of everybody yeah on the team wonderful any questions from anyone all good uh, so let's move on to the next project. Uh, okay, so I guess it is my turn to speak. Um, um, I, I'd be really grateful, again if someone could say whether you can hear me all right. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, so unfortunately, Hannah is not here today, and she asked me to cover for her. And I was like, yeah, great. And then my internet died, so I will do for it. Uh, yeah, I guess I will start uh, where I can. So um, the way I'm going to try to structure the presentation is by uh, first talking about what we've done in terms of collecting the data, and then trying to move on to the topic of you know, future plans and um, actually say enough what I can do with the data. Uh, so the current state of the data collection is um, that we had around 1.7 million posts collected from Facebook since the beginning of the data collection. And some of the important fields and features we can extract from those posts are like the, the language of the post, the categories of the page um, that posted the post, um, something like media or entertainment or official government um, body, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we also know the exact plus or minus one hour deletion window if the post gets taken down from the platform. And the next slide, please. Um, so Oops. having yes. all that, um, we can look at the at this data with like different levels of granularity, and meaning that we can look at all of the posts 
at the database and say, hey, like this is the specific distribution of the languages we have at this moment. And then we can look at specific pages or specific posts that um, for whatever reasons interest us and say, hey, so this is what this specific post looks like in terms of like categories or language or the geographical location of the person that posted it. Uh, the next slide, please. And so having all that, um, we can talk about the categories of the posts and the pages, uh, but that is the part that I've covered during the last presentation. So I'm, I'm going to um, stop here. The next slide, please. What is more interested? Uh, what, what's more interesting about the um, posts uh, in terms of like the context is the language, and this is the part that we've been trying to focus on during the, this month. Um, the idea is that the Facebook has an inherent language detection feature uh, that is provided by the API, and so we know what is the primary language that the page posts in, and we know what the distribution of the posts of the post language are for some specific category or label or top engaged page. The next slide, please. Um, so here are like two examples of what we can do with this. Um, on the left, there's a chart of a dashboard baseline. You can see three charts. Um, you a are you and other um, those are the geographical locations of the posts and you can see uh with different colors uh there uh, those are the languages of the posts by number so you can see that in the ua dashboard uh, those are the posts which originate from ukraine um, there are a lot of posts in green uh, which is ukrainian um, there are some posts in Russian, and there are some posts uh, which are coded as UND. Uh, this is undefined um, for a specific reason. I'm not going to talk about here. Um, and on the right, there is a chart of top one, uh, top thousand posts that are posted during the last two weeks, and you can see that the top thousand posts in Ukrainian dashboard are in Ukraine, but there's also a significant part of those which are written in Russian. And at the bottom, there is the other dashboards. And you can see that um, there are posts in both Ukrainian, Russian, and some other languages, which is pretty expected. Uh, the next slide, please. And what I also encountered while looking at the different pages and top engagement pages is that there are some weird pages, like um, the pages that repost a lot of links, but for whatever reason, um, the text, the text of those links are like usual words in Cyrillic, but for some reason mixed with um, Latin letters. Uh, the next slide, please. And having that granularity um, in terms of uh, being able to look like per page uh, or per post basis, we can see, uh, for example, for the page that posted the post uh, from the previous slide, we can see that there is an unnatural growth um, of followers uh, because it abruptly starts at some point and then suddenly it comes to an end. And we can try to theorize and speculate that um, this could be a like, bot operating page. And this is something we could focus on. The next slide, please. The next slide is the last one. So um, yeah, the possible future plans. Um, well, the, the, the main idea is that we've collected a lot of data uh, but all of that was kind of done to to be actually later able to evaluate the efficacy and biases of content removal because we would be able to uh, compare 
what content gets taken down and what, what content does not. And we can also look at the accuracy of the Facebook language detection tool. And well, actually writing a paper on all of this. Uh, that'd be really nice. Um, and I believe I still have 30 seconds left. Uh, so I'd be grateful to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Boris. Uh, any questions from anyone? Please, Stacey, yes. Yeah, sorry, I have some party <laughs> nearby, but I have a question. Uh, Boris, why do you think you can use the results of this analysis? Um, I'm interested in like any specific results or like in general. Um, uh, no, for example, like you evaluate how like the Facebook is removing uh, the posts and uh, detecting the language, like, for example, sorry. Um, okay, so let me start from, from the easy part. Um, detecting the language is pretty much easy because that's the part we've been working on during the summer part of the project. And we know there are libraries that are like 98% accurate in terms of detecting Ukrainian and Russian languages. And so we can run that through the whole database and compare that to the labels provided by the Facebook and see how accurate those are. Because we know the library itself is pretty much accurate. Because we've done the manual evaluation and we see that it is indeed accurate. Um, in terms of using the results uh, for analyzing the content removal, um, the point is, uh, and again, this is um, going back to the granularity, um, for each specific post, we can see the trend line, like the graph of how the engagement evolves over time. And we know that, for example, roughly after, like, a day or two since the post publication, it it reaches like it almost reaches its, its maximum audience. So the engagement is like ninety percent of what the post's top engagement ever could be, and this is backed by the like our parents' paper published by our mentors. And so the idea is that once we're able to see the actual deletions. Uh, because we've built all of the necessary um, tools for that. Uh, we we know when the post gets removed. Uh, we can then say that, well, if the post was taken down after a week, um, this is ineffective because everyone who could possibly see the post already saw it. And so there is no effect on the reach of the post on, on, on Facebook. Okay. Thank you. So let's let's move to the last presentation. Uh, and uh, Stacy, are you able to to present this? Yes, yes, I'm here. I'm just okay, perfect. It became very romantic here, but I yeah. hope I'm not I'm not losing any electricity, any more electricity. Uh, yes, hi everyone. So I'm gonna present today like what have been we have been working on the CNRD. Uh, just to remind you, it's our project for differential privacy and synthetic data sets for investigating research. Next slide. And uh, actually, for the last uh, several months, we have been working on uh, improving the work we've done in our summer research. And basically, at that time, we were able to present like the framework for evaluating different papers in, in, so, in social science, and also the data synthesizers for producing uh, differentially private data. And now our main focus like was on four main directions. First of all, it was the theory, which was uh, mostly involved, Lucas was involved, also Julia, and uh, finding the ways of how we can evaluate the 
findings which involve confidence intervals. Uh, the next direction was the, actually the benchmark. So this is the main tool that we were, wanted to present for the research community in terms of producing new uh, data synthesizers and being able to evaluate on the papers that we already reproduced and uh, reproduce the findings for, and also like discovering different patterns on which kind of uh, papers these synthesizers could work or not. And this actually involved like uh, adding the synthesizers functionality, uh, basically being able to add the wrapper for the synthesizers for any new synthesizers that would be created and making it uh, in like the more like in the unified uh, way of how so you can do it easily and actually it, uh, like add it to the and evaluate the synthesizer on the bench, benchmark and the last part is basically was about the package and uh, how you collect it into one uh, uh, very comfortable to use tool so you can pip install it and use it for your synthesizer next slide and basically um okay there are some uh, is it the wrong one? one no it's uh, the right one but there's okay. yes. <laughs> um, yes, so basically, uh, if you sum it up again, so um, the aim of SYNRD is to allow researchers to test data synthesizers. And we want to make it as simple as possible with a powerful API. And uh, yes, yeah, so we were focused on the most influential papers and rep reproduced and data sets which are commonly used. And here you can see the piece of the code like of how you can actually test your synthesizer uh, in a very nice and readable way. Uh, so yes, so basically you add the synthesizer, you call the benchmark class, and then you evaluate your synthesizer on the papers in the, in the papers package. And also, if you want to add a paper, you can use the same uh, classes and uh, wrappers to add your paper. Okay, and then you can get a summary on how it actually worked on different uh, papers and findings in different in in from different papers okay next slide yeah so currently we already have a possibility to install this package uh pretty easily and just to use it next slide and also we have been working on some ci cd functionality so for example Priorly to add in like the papers, we were work, all working in Jupyter notebooks, and currently you can use the GitHub Actions to actually run all of that and get a nice Jupyter book about that. So you can see all the results around the papers that you edit uh, in one uh, comfortable way. Next slide. Yes. So basically, you can run it, and also we are currently adding the functionality to test like all of the parts of the package, including the synthesizer, so you can uh, see that it's working. Okay. Next one. Oh, there's more here. Okay. Uh, yes, I just you. Yeah, and uh, I think that the fun part uh, on the Lucas and uh, the last side was also like again understanding how to evaluate the significant um, intervals, and I think uh, there was an idea of how you how you can evaluate using bootstrapping uh, in terms of producing different sets of synthetic data and evaluating the significant interval and seeing how often uh, the actual mean uh, comes into the synthet like the mean from the synthetic data sets. And I think Lucas has some progress on that already, but I didn't present the, the <laughs> so, but let's, let's wrap, wrap it up. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much, Stacy. Uh, and you. yes, indeed, there's there's progress on on the uh, conceptual side as well. And uh, we are preparing to submit a paper to VLDB on this to the experiments and analysis track uh, either at the end of January, hopefully, or if not, then at the end of February. Yes, thank you. In, any questions? And sorry that we're a little bit over time.
So just as a general discussion point, uh, Tanya is setting up a uh, meeting, right, for folks that, that would, would take place maybe every two weeks. Do you want to say a few words about this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. First of all, I would like to thank you all of you for this semester and for all one-to-one -one meeting with you. And you share a lot of uh, great ideas about the next uh, steps and next collaboration. And we have uh, really an idea next semester to have uh, offline meetings. Uh, you, you said that, uh, as you see today, that five minutes, it's just short time <laughs> to uh, go deeply in the like um, uh, different projects. Uh, so we decided to, to have uh, next semester meeting. Uh, where we can uh, share more uh, about our projects. So I will I will write about it later. Uh, so just let you know <laughs> that we will collaborate more next semester. Great. And then I'm also assuming that all of you are staying on, right, for for the for the January and then spring. And then I'll be in touch with each of you to discuss the actual number of hours, etc. Uh, and you all, of course, are always welcome to join uh, our group meetings by Zoom. These run weekly. Uh, we don't have any meetings scheduled for January, but we will restart uh, either the last week of January or the first week of February. If you're not on the invite, let me know and I will add you uh, if you haven't been receiving these, these messages. Anything else from anyone else? Uh, yeah, yeah, Julia, uh, thank you so much for this Wednesday meeting uh, during this semester. It was really nice to, to, to join and uh, have the opportunity to listen uh, and uh, to, to see how you make research in New York. <laughs> and we have <laughs> visitors really nice. also, so it's, it's really great for you all to join. Unfortunately, we don't yet know how to send food over by, by internet. <laughs> 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 Yeah, uh, maybe we should gather together in a cool with pizza. <laughs> yeah, have, right. have some, some, some trust. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. And good luck to all of us submitting papers. Let's hope that that they get accepted, and then maybe we could even meet in person uh, at one yeah. of these conferences, right? So let's let's see. Yeah. Let's see what happens. It, it would be amazing really work, great. everybody. Be safe. Happy holidays, and we will be in touch again uh, to to continue next semester. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you yeah, so much. Thanks. So much Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you so well. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.